Yes. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Chris. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Katrin, for, for the position. And welcome to everyone that is going and that is joining us in the sixth edition of the Ecosystem Summit. Uh, we are very uh, happy you're here listening to us. Uh, we are now moving on to, to the next topic in the agenda, which is a panel on linking open innovation and startup ecosystem development. We have three, three panelists uh, joining us today. Uh, let, me, let me introduce you to them and then we'll, we, we'll get them to speak a little bit about themselves before starting the panel. So uh, first we have Max Vieil. He's the global director of the Response Innovation Lab. We also have Simon Hardy, the co-founder of Findexo. And uh, last but not least, we have Ran Sasson. He's uh, an entrepreneurship ecosystems developer, developer uh, expert in rural, rural regions. He's the manager of several accelerators and leader of uh, the Climate, climate Launchpad Israel. So yes, uh, thank you very much to all for being here. Can we have a, a brief introduction from each of you starting in, in the order I mentioned you, please? Sure, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Gerst. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm Max uh, and maybe I'll share my screen for just a second because it's, uh, I think a picture is worth uh, a, thousand, a thousand words as they say. So Response Innovation Lab, is uh, essentially a network of platforms in what you would call very much frontier economies, so places that are affected by humanitarian disaster. Uh, let me full, full screen here. And so what we do in these places is really to try to connect the humanitarian system with the innovation ecosystem. And I think what we've seen based, you know, I think hearing the, some of the previous presentations is, you know, you find these kind of highly dynamic, very, uh, very uh, socially mindful uh, startups and social enterprises all around the world, including places where people that people don't necessarily think of, like Somalia, uh, like Iraq and elsewhere. And it's our sort of responsibility to try to bring those actors in closer connection with the humanitarian system that is delivering uh, support to populations that are impacted by crisis. So we do this through ecosystem mapping, through uh, a lot of partner, you know, sort of networking, brokering and support of these uh, innovations. I'm gonna stop there, but it's really nice to be part of this panel. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much. Very interesting what you what you guys do at, at Response Innovation Lab. Very happy to have you here. Uh, next, please, uh, Simon Hardy, can you please introduce yourself and, and your organization? Yep. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, so Findexable is a, a fintech innovation um, consultancy. We work with ecosystems, we work with founders, we work with institutions to help uh, with their innovation strategy and innovation planning. And what that means in practice really is at uh, the level of the ecosystem, it's understanding you know, where FinTech fits at the level of, you know, of motivation, a priority. Um, how, can that, how, can I make it, how can a city uh, both expand its FinTech ecosystem? How can, they, how can they make it attractive to attract FinTech entrepreneurs? But also increasingly what we're seeing with uh, the level of smart cities and where I am in, where I am in, in the Gulf at the minute, uh, Dubai, Saudi Arabia in particular, are both really thinking about the role of uh, fintech and digital in, in building out smart cities at the level of cyber, at the level of digital identity, but also transactions. Uh, and then with institutions, then we work, you know, my institutions, I, I mean, as incumbent banks, uh, we work with them in different parts of the world to identify innovations that, that fit their, their digital transformation roadmap, or that can help them solve you know, urgent, urgent challenges, or indeed, uh, um, you know, speaking to the, uh, the, the frontier markets world, you know, how uh, FinTech might enable them to, to open a new product or expand digitally without a physical footprint. So you know, that's, the, that's, our, that's our work, if you like. Good, good to be here today. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much. And, and next, please, Ran, can you, can you introduce yourself? Hi, good morning. Um, well, what I'm doing is uh, 
specifically developing especially rural areas uh, ecosystems which means like while many main cities in the world develop their ecosystems building startups like crazy all doing all this uh, all the rural areas uh, kept behind left behind uh, it's a challenge all over the world uh, there's natural places like Canada or or Sweden or now and I'm in Argentina which are struggling to develop uh, the non-main cities uh, to get into the game and develop their own um, startup ecosystems so uh, what we did in Israel as a model or as a pilot is built a uh, 22 uh, accelerators around the the nation and through that we build an, a mesh a network of uh, ecosystems and To build startups all over the nation and that in that way uh, we enabled a lot of non-connected populations uh, into the got them into the game of uh, innovation startups and entrepreneurships so that's what I'm doing on the side I'm doing a national climate startup a uh, climate um, acceleration program in Israel and a uh, part of a national international network and some more but that's about it amazing amazing thank you very much to to all of you again for for joining us today uh, and well let's let's start the the actual meet of the panel and uh, start discussing some of the topics that we are here to discuss uh, first I think uh, it would be better to to just to open up a, a couple of questions that uh, just jump up any of you uh, jump on the questions and uh, answer uh, whatever is in your mind and then we'll have we'll have a uh, specific questions for each of you if if we still have time after the general discussion okay so first we wanted to ask all of you where uh, Why is open innovation and in general collaboration between between different organizations uh, important for startups and startup ecosystems around the world? So uh, I have two answers for this questions. one on the side of the startups and one on the side of the ecosystem. On, 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 on the, the startup aspect, many startupists are very keen about the solution. It's very well known that the main problem, well, well, the statistics shows that almost half of the startups fail due to the reason that they developed something that the kind of the world doesn't need. There's no product market fit um, for the solutions. So open innovation, Is making sure that this doesn't happen maybe other problems will happen maybe technology will fail but this reason won't happen which means that they, they're solving a problem that we are sure that the open innovation side uh, enterprises governmentals municipalities others need this solution to begin with so open innovation is a very good way to validate the startup and a product market fit which is half of the answer and the other side of the answer is that all this solution that the enterprises government need is become a matter in climate and other aspects become a matter of urgency nowadays so open innovation is kind of a way to look for fast An accurate solution to problems that are currently uh, running around uh, uh, surrounding us challenges that we we are facing and we need to solve so on the side of the startups is doing validation uh, which is very very important and on the side of the government the enterprises uh, open innovation is a way to solve the challenges so both ways needed Yeah, I think I'd add to that. I mean, you know, really the, the, the answer is for me that you know, um, no company, small or large, um, is an island any longer. Um, you know, companies have to work together. You know, a corporate needs a startup, a, a, an established bank needs a fintech, 
uh, and, by, and back the other way. You know, small companies cannot solve, they can come up with the idea and the innovation, but if, the, if that ecosystem is not open to working and, and to partnering, um, it's not going to get very far. At the same time, if a bank still thinks that it, a bank or a large corporate still thinks that it can innovate from within and transform you know, a, a very layered, quite traditionally siloed structure with thousands and thousands of employees and, and disrupt itself, you know, it, it, it also won't get very far. I think the second part to this um, is, is really just to say that um, you know, open innovation is a, it's a, it's a mindset it's a mindset shift at the one level, but it's also an economic reality and an economic imperative. You know, we are moving because of the internet, because of digital commerce, we are moving very rapidly, um, particularly in some parts of the world, very rapidly into the platform economy. And the platform economy is totally reliant on partnerships and at the level of business development, at the level of sales, commercial models, and technology investment and innovation. So for me, those are the kind of drivers that I think um, Know, an ecosystem, a city, uh, and city thinkers, city planners need to think about if they if they're serious about you know genuinely building out uh, their innovation ecosystems and making their locations attractive to to entrepreneurs. Thanks, and I mean, yeah, to, to just add to that, I think particularly in the kind of economies where where we work. Um, we see open innovation as being potentially quite transformational and it really is being pushed by the humanitarian system as a, as a solution to some many pervasive issues. The biggest one being about scaling, uh, which can be quite difficult when the ecosystem themselves are underperforming. Uh, so you, you try to ver scale vertically uh, within a single kind of ownership structure, and it just simply doesn't work unless people you have enough co you know coalescence around a particular product, or um, uh, and then you know when you're working across multiple countries, you you have barriers. So you know open innovation really helps with the kind of horizontal scaling for multiple stakeholders, multiple organizations to uh, to apply technology, to to experiment with it, to to make it work for them. Uh, and I think for for that's allowing more impact to happen much more quickly. Uh, I would say the second thing is that it also removes a lot of barriers of entry. Uh, it lets uh, sort of local uh, uh, tech people, local startups, you know, use uh, a, a platforms and, and, and approaches that have been proven. Uh, so that they don't, they have fewer kind of uh, entry barriers and sort of upfront costs to to applying technology and to, to making that work for in their particular context. And we saw that during COVID. Yeah, we saw that during COVID quite a bit uh, with the maker movement, uh, you know, uh, with seeing countries all over the world starting to produce masks, produce ventilator equipment uh, with shared sort of tools and knowledge. And I, and I would say the, the, the third thing that, that where open innovation can, can help is in these countries that don't have very strong kind of intellectual property protection laws, uh, it, it sort of circumvents that problem, moves around that issue, and allows people to, to at, with an ease of peace of mind and not having to engage in piracy and these sort of you know shady kind of uh dealings to actually be a very upfront honest and transparent about using uh technology to to uh to make their uh their projects work great great thank you thank you all for for your uh, very interesting answers uh, i i do have a question uh, there are some places in which uh, open in innovation has, has uh, let's say, established itself more than others. Uh, so uh, in, in countries that open innovation is, let's say, at a nascent stage or in existence, in existent, do you, do you believe the public sector has a big role to play uh, in making sure open innovation happens in the ecosystem? I'll, I might start because I think we're working very much in these kind of countries. Oh, sorry, Simon, did you want to go? No, no, I didn't. I, I just, I just didn't get the question. I, it cut out at that point. Sorry. It's about. It's about uh, if you think the public sector should be a main actor uh, in making sure that open innovation happens in an ecosystem if it's not already happening. Okay. Good. Yeah. I was going to say, I think for us, it's really important that there is clarity and consensus of what, what is meant by open innovation. And more broadly than that, I think one of the challenges we run, we come across quite a lot 
in, I mean, we work mostly in, in, in East Africa and the Middle East, but uh, a lot of lack of clarity around intellectual property. And so I think that's part of the problem is people, sometimes people taking open innovation and trying to make it proprietary. We see that happen quite a bit, uh, and but vice versa as well. People taking uh, taking private information and trying to, to make it available to, to, to the public. So I think having the a clarity of what is meant uh, by open innovation, what the legal framework around it, I mean, that's a huge role for the government to play uh, and just for them to to communicate that to um, to their to society at large, to the economy, to the to the actors. Yes, that's I think that that has to be kind of a prerequisite for open innovation to function, you know, appropriately in these contexts. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd add to that also. Um, you know, at the level of financial services, open innovation is a step more. It's actually a regulatory imperative as much as it is a, a, a thesis or a theory or a concept. Um, uh, certainly, um, you know, a, a country that's serious about financial, financial innovation, about fintech innovation, which is both you know, um, a driver of the economy as a whole, but also you know, a creator of jobs through uh, startup activity and uh, entrepreneurship. Um, you know, the, the reality is that you know, you're not going to get again. You're not going to get very far unless the public sector is heavily involved. It can it can be, you know, but there are flavours of involvement also. Um, so the UK. Europe took a very proactive view with regard to open banking, which was very much around you know, enabling data sharing, a, you know, safe, secure data sharing to enable you know, new companies to come into the marketplace to get access to financial data in a secure way and innovate on top of that without actually touching anybody's funds or anybody's transactions or, or liquidity. Um, so you know, those kind of um, rules-based uh, principles and rules-based uh, regions, regulators, you know, certainly certainly say that they, that drives an impact that has an impact in the, in the sense of building out the innovation community um, uh, different markets of course you know apply things in, in different ways dubai the gulf where i am particularly dubai actually um you know, they they they've always believed that private you know, well before the innovation economy took off over the last decade you know they, they built the city state of dubai on the basis that public and private needed to work together they needed to you know, it, was a, it was very much a sort of hand in hand operation. One supported the other. Um, you know, and, and that is how they built the ecosystem that is now here. And it is a sizable and rapidly accelerating ecosystem. I think the, the final point to say is, you know, which, which often gets overlooked, you know, we were on a panel session this morning talking about central bank digital currency. I'm going to go into the mechanics of that, but it's basically the, the, the central bank equivalent of, of Bitcoin. Um, and of course, you know, lots of lots of governments, lots of cities around the world are are playing with this with this this concept of digital money, of you know, minting their own digital money, i.e., taking you know, trying to drive cash out of the economy and switching it all over to a digital currency. Um, and and a big problem for them, much like much like any startup, is adoption. Is, you know, if they do this, um, customers already pay and transact and they make you know, they go about their business in a certain way anyway so what you're actually talking about is is, is changing behavior and of course if you're a government um, you cannot you know, you're, if you're a government and you're trying to drive financial innovation um for all the motivations we've talked about you know you also do actually have access to all the, all the customers and what you can do is because because you because citizens have to transact with the government they have to pay taxes they have to pay fines they might apply for services, um, you know, the government could actually have a very viable role in, in, in rolling out new, new forms of identity, new ways of transacting and new methods of payment. So, you know, I, I think if you look around the world, you have to say, well, Singapore, Dubai, you know, as some city state places, you know, they've really seen that that part private public private partnership is, is, is what's going to make, you know, it's, going, it's what's going to help them leapfrog into the future, which I think is really what we're talking about. Well, I look at it. Uh, well, first, I, I'd like to to um, second the the what Maxim spoke about the IP problem, which is very good role playing uh, while government is involved. While I was in this role, it was very important uh, mitigating those IP problems or any problems actually when I have the back or when I am the government and I'm playing a role in the game whatever I say rules. So usually that solves many problems. Um, and in a, actually it looks like harsh, but actually it, it, it enabled and 
accelerated a lot of um, cooperation in in problems that there isn't any or or little. So that said, um, more of a um, look. Um, even even the corporates and the governments now eighty two percent I think is by research is is um, open to work with startups and so on, but they don't know how. So governments or um, yeah governments are, are key role players in this game, uh, and and on the same time like said on Dubai sometimes the corporates are, are the are the initiators of this relationship. Um, well, if I take it to my aspect, talking about uh, areas that are non-main cities, as, so open innovation there run by, by corporates is usually the, the fuel, usually the, the, the main key players in rural areas where there, there's like huge or one or few corporates playing a role in rural areas in each area. And then while you engage with them, you get two things. One, the entrepreneurships come from their needs, which is, again, like I said before, it's 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 product market fit and it's great. Government is enablers. They get them to the, all the rest kind of uh, PR, va, uh, val, kind of validation and saying that they're okay. They are real players. They're not taking your IPs and all these kinds of uh, um, aspects. And also they're, they're enabling them uh, to, to become even more key players in the region that they're already in. Uh, if they're doing all the business, all the work there, all the um, workers come to this, uh, working in these uh, main um, enterprises, then now they're becoming a player in the ecosystem um, innovation, which is a total, um, a new aspect for them being uh, innovative, uh, more uh, young, more relevant to the times that we're uh, in. So government should be a, a key player in this um, ecosystem. And I'm just going to add one more thing, and I'm, I might I'm actually going to lead into the next question. But I think one of the key things for government is to be a user of, of open innovation and to, to sort of lead the way. Um, and I think that can be quite a powerful stance if they use open innovation to develop their national systems, uh, because a it's a clear signal to the whole ecosystem that you know that this is worth uh, you know this is credible, this is worth you know supporting it's also good on, uh, probably i think from a on a public policy front you know for something that's much more sustainable that will require less re fewer resources to uh to, to to maintain and to to enhance um uh, and that you know that i think is is something especially when you have countries where there's government you know as a main provider of social services or as a very strong footprint in the economy it's very critical for them to to be adopters as well. And we saw, I think, during COVID, uh, you know, in the at least in the very early days, it seemed that every European country was trying to develop their own kind of app, you know, their own app system based on their own technology. Uh, and it really took a long time for things to just sort of coalesce. What I will say is, I think the barrier to that, obviously, is that this it's less open innovation seems very a good fit for governments that are trans already transparent and already sort of have a good governance kind of model, but it's it removes a lot of the incentives from governments that are perhaps less transparent. So no no big contracts, kind of like hidden contracts and uh, all that goes along with that, 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 you know, by definition, open innovation is more transparent, is, is probably less prone to abuse. Uh, but that, that can be a disincentive if, if, the, if the, the country itself isn't, you know, operating in, in, in that kind of a good governance scheme. So that, that could be a barrier as to why these open innovations aren't spreading in some parts of the world where, where that, uh, when there's no personal gain, I think, in some cases for their adoption. Oh, if we're talking about the challenges, um, I would I would look about the the two problems or the two sides of the story of the deal flow. So on one aspect, there's not enough deal flow. On the other aspect, when you go to an enterprise, think about any enterprise that you have in mind. They have a problem dealing with the deal flow. They don't know how to manage it. They don't know how to do, you know, they don't have even 
the structure of contracts working with startups. They don't know how to do it. Uh, a startup comes with a solution saying, okay, I would like to solve this and that problem. And the enterprise say, hey, that's great. Um, I'd like to, you to do that. How much do I need to pay you? And bring me a contract. And hey, there's no contract. Nobody knows how to work with this kind of scale. So, and there's no guarantees. The enterprise don't know how to work with non-guaranteed contracts. You know, we not we are not sure that the technology will work. So, how do we provide it, or how do we structure an agreement around it? Well, we don't know how to work with it. So, these kinds of challenges. The main the main challenges uh, handling those. I don't know, amorphic phone calls or emails to the enterprise saying, hey, we have this, maybe we have a solution for you in this and that regard, but, um, um, and the enterprise doesn't know how, what, what to do with it. So in the middle, that's part of being, uh, uh, getting the governments in between sometimes, but uh, handling an, a, a deal flow structure, kind of a funnel that takes all those, uh, leads of, of solutions, startups, whatever they are, and getting them slowly, slowly structured into the enterprise. Uh, um, we have in some kinds, some places in the world, we have some kind of a deal flow structure. We do hackathons over that. We do accelerations. On top of these, we do kind of in incubators or testing pilots incubators. And on top of that, we're getting the real solution scaled up into the enterprises. So we have kind of a ladder, stepping stones into this, um, uh, from, from an ideation to real scaled up solution, we have this kind of a funnel structure. And I think that's, that's the main um, challenge that uh, it's not structured enough nowadays yet. Thank you, Ram. Yeah, but, uh, Thank you. I think there are some uh, Yeah. Things. Sorry, sorry, Simon. One second. We have a, a, a just one minute left. I'm sorry for the for the oh, short notice, but uh, <laughs> let, let us hear your your perspective about the challenges, Simon. Uh, and I'm very sorry to interrupt like this. No, no, I thought I was going to apologize. I lost track of the time. It's good. I'm going to slightly catch anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Rand's um, absolutely right. I mean, you know, those, those, that that challenge of that that pathway for startup to face to get access to the company in the first place and then when they've got access to have someone help them navigate navigate through you know a very what are often complex large layered organizations so they, yeah, that's, that's absolutely a challenge i think however there is massive progress in different markets and um, you know we've seen you know you know a, a good decade of, sort of digital revolution we've certainly a good decade of uh, perhaps a service of fintech of the, of the fintech revolution proliferating um, you know, at, at, at a kind of crazy pace around the world. And in, 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 in a lot of places, um, we are seeing a lot more open innovation within uh, fintech ecosystems purely because um, uh, the digital economy has taken off, particularly over the last two years. And then on the other side, going back to the public sector, we see regulators which are saying, actually, you know, and agreed, you know, this tends to be a more established, more, you know, more advanced market, perhaps the long term one thing. But you know, we are seeing lots of regulation, lots of regulators saying, well, actually, if we, if we, if we assume now that, that, that money is actually data or data is money, um, then, then surely that our regulation should be targeted at that. That should then create a more competitive marketplace. That's how we'll get innovation. Um, I, I, you know, and then, and then you know, very good things, very, very good things can come. You don't necessarily need regulation to do that, but, but, but it's certainly a proven uh, sort of entry point to, 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 make, to make that happen. Because you know, if you open up the competitive landscape, the corporates um, start to actually, you know, I don't think this startup over here is necessarily going to be completely out of business tomorrow. But but a thousand of them might take it might well be just for a thousand perhaps if we don't do something about this and, and we have to have our own innovation program and again it, it's, it's you know, there are many 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 different flavors of that but the, the big financial institutions that have done it well have, have both taken an active approach they've taken a very good you know, full on you know, stance they they face the issues head on 
And in many cases, they, they may have accelerated the program, but subsequently they may have completely hired the office of so that innovation program can just do its own thing and the company can get out of the way. And at a point when it's ready to bring in, then there's a then there's a proper roadmap and a pathway and a stakeholder involved to can make sure that it doesn't get stuck in the layer of the management. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, Ran and Maxime. Uh, we really appreciate uh, hearing about your perspectives about open innovation and startup ecosystems. And uh, yeah, uh, it was a pleasure having uh, having you guys in in the in the summit. And uh, right now we'll go back to the pitching of startup ecosystems. So Katrin will will take it again from me. Good luck. Bye, guys. It was Thank a you. pleasure. Bye. It was a great pleasure.